Okay, everybody, I'll get started with some of our housekeeping remarks today. Hopefully you are here for the correct session, landscape least wanted, native replacements for your yard. Either way, we hope that you stay and enjoy this wonderful first session of our Backyard Symposium webinar series. The Van Buren Conservation District is so excited to have you. I'm Emily. I'll be your moderator today from the district. Um, just um, going through the slide here, you can get in touch with us after the fact uh, by messaging us through our contact form on our website. That's vanburencd.org slash contact. Just a simple form there. You can reach us. Um, our Email addresses are also on the website under the About Us tab, so you can reach individual folks there as well. Um, just a note, this webinar is being recorded, and our recordings will be edited and posted at our YouTube page, which is Van Buren CD, um, the week after we get all of these presentations done. So look for those next week, and since you have registered, you'll receive an email once they've been posted as well. You can also keep up with us on Facebook at Van Buren CD. And you will notice that live captioning is available. If that is not showing up for you, you can click on the closed caption button. It looks a bit like what I have screenshot there. In addition, at the end of Nora's presentation, we will have time for a question answer session. So in order to participate in that, you can click on the Q&A icon which will be towards the bottom or top of your screen. You can submit a question there. I will be helping to moderate those. Um, you'll just type the question in the box and then click the send button. If any come in before nor is finished, that's fine. We will get to them when it is the appropriate time. Um, and I'll be checking the chat too, just in case questions pop up in there. If for some reason your question has not been answered and we seem to be wrapping up, please just send it through again. We don't want to miss anything, um, but it can happen. So if during the course of the presentation you need any help with Zoom functions or you can't find the Q&A box or anything like that, please use the chat, um, which also is this little tab there to reach out to me. My name under the list of folks you can chat with is VBCD moderator or help. Um, so just message me there and send a direct message. You don't have to send it to everyone in the meeting. Um, all right, I think that that will take us to um, to Noor. So I will go ahead and stop sharing and you can start, Noor. Fantastic. Um, that should be good. How does that look, Emily? That looks great. And since you turned it over to me, I'm going to read your bio really quick because <laughs> I forgot. I'm so sorry. Um, so everyone, for those of you that aren't familiar, I just am so familiar that I forgot to even introduce our dear Noor. Um, Eleanor or Noor Siraki is the Southwest by Southwest Corner Sisma coordinator. Uh, she also works at the Van Buren Conservation District. And this Southwest by Southwest Corner Sisma is a grant funded program that helps residents in Berrien, Cass, and Van Buren counties fight invasive species. Since 2016, NOR has worked with residents, municipalities, and managers to better understand and address the problems that invasive species pose to protect our environment, economy, and health. So we're excited to hear from her today and um, ready to let you take it away. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Wonderful introduction, Emily. I'm really glad that we were able to make this kind of online symposium work. It's something that we have been kicking around and wanting to make happen for so long. And in this um, this time where we are able to get online and offer some of these services, I'm really excited to be able to be speaking to residents about some of those invasive species that we see very commonly in the landscape trade or in yards that we may want to get out of there and replace with something native. Um, this presentation, I do want to point out, is co-hosted by the Liberty High Bailey Museum. They're a fantastic organization based out of South Haven that really does some amazing work in educating all ages about the fantastic ways that we can help support our ecology and some of our 
more um, fragile ele elements of permaculture, that kind of thing. I really encourage you to check them out both on Facebook and on their website uh, and get out there if you have a chance to check out a little bit more about the life and history of Liberty Hyde Bailey. Today, in the landscapes least wanted, we're focusing in on invasive species and some of the threats that those can pose to our ecology, to our landscape and in our environment, and kind of what we can do on our own properties to help make the world a little bit, a uh, little bit safer from some of those species. So I want to start off by defining what an invasive species is. This is a term that gets used in a lot of different ways by a lot of different people. And the biggest thing with invasive species is that they have two primary factors. They have to be not native to the area, meaning that they were brought here through colonization or um, by, by human actions that, that brought these species to our area, and then they have to cause significant damage. So that would be damage to our economy, things like Japanese knotweed, which can damage infrastructure, costing thousands of dollars in some cases. It could be a damage to our ecology or our environment, which is what we generally think of, right? So things like emerald ash borer, which removed the the ash from many of our forests would be a negative impact to our ecology, or it can be a damage to human health. So a species like giant hogweed can cause some pretty terrible burns to the skin, and so that is why that species is listed as invasive. Now there are a lot of non-native species that are not invasive, and that could be for a number of reasons. For instance, it could be something that doesn't really naturalize, so it can't survive outside of human captivity, if you will. It's not something that's going to really thrive and take over. So that would be the tomato you see there on your right. It's not going anywhere, <laughs> right? Uh, it's something that isn't going to cause problems on its own outside of cultivation. Um, or on the other hand there, that is um, bittersweet nightshade that is very closely related to the tomato, but that is something that has naturalized and now is causing problems. So we have a lot of non-native species that we don't consider invasive, things like Queen Anne's lace, for instance. We also have a lot of native species that do cause problems. <laughs> so things like poison ivy, are not necessarily popular. They can cause a threat to human health, um, but that is not considered invasive just because it's causing problems because it's supposed to be here. There are moth species, for instance, that require that or utilize that as a host for their caterpillars. So it has a place in our ecology that it would be non-invasive. On the other side of that Venn diagram, we have things like blue spruce. It's not native here, but it's not causing anyone any problems. It's not getting wild, it's not escaping, that kind of horticultural setting, we're going to let that one go. And then in the middle, we have what we would consider invasive, something that isn't from around here that does cause problems. And in this case, that example is Asian longhorn beetle, which is an insect that is not in Michigan, but has a wide variety of host species that it will feed on. So it can kill off maple trees, willows, elms, pretty much any hardwood tree. It's happy to get its little calissery in. So the overall idea of this is that we want to take those invasive species, those non-native damage-causing species out of our environment and put in native species. And even if it is in our yard, say we live in downtown St. Joe, right? We, we live in the middle of more of an urban environment. We think, well, I have this species here. It's, I'm not in nature. I'm not participating in this ecological setting. So it's not really causing a problem. Unfortunately, they don't have a tendency to stay put. A lot of invasive species are things that seed or spread very easily. So even if you do live in the middle of a city, the likelihood of it spreading either by root or by seed that could be moved by birds is pretty high. So it is best to remove that risk from our area so that we can better protect some of those more intact ecological areas that we love, like Warren Woods or uh, the Black River Preserve, because every instance of these invasive species on our landscape is another risk of it escaping. So we want to bring in native species, and native species are kind of the um, kind of the pinnacle that we're we're aiming for in a lot of our landscaping, because they provide a lot of services that invasive species can't. So from a habitat perspective, this is something that our pollinators and our animals 
recognize. It's a species that they can utilize and make use of for homes, for food, for brood habitat. It is something that isn't going to outcompete or be aggressive on a landscape scale. And so it's a little bit safer to keep in our yards from that perspective. It's really better adapted to some of our weather patterns. So in a lot of cases, it's easier to have some native species in our yards because they know what Michigan winters are supposed to feel like. They know what some of those drought periods in the summer are like, and they're adapted to that kind of weather change. And really, in a lot of cases, they are, they've co-adapted, they've co-evolved with those species we want to keep, like our monarch butterflies, right? So they are the recognizable food sources or brood habitats for a lot of the species that we want to keep around. So I always advocate for native species. They're beautiful, they're diverse. There's one for every little niche because something's gonna grow there um, that we can really find a little bit better. So for instance, here we have um, butterfly weed and wild lupine, two great native species that are very aesthetically pleasing, uh, but also fantastic sources of pollen or um, habitat for some of our pollinator species. So I'm, what I'm going to do today is go through some of our bigger offenders. So those invasive species that I see pretty commonly that are still in trade, that are easy to put into our landscapes and give you some native alternatives that would serve a fuller purpose for our landscape and for our yards. So I want it's not necessarily going to be a one-to-one -one substitution, but it's something that, well, if I want a flowering tree for the springtime, here's another flowering tree that is going to serve a secondary purpose in our yards. Please note, of course, this is not an exhaustive list of invasive species. There are hundreds of species that either are invasive or could potentially become invasive here in Michigan. And so there really is too much to include in one hour, but these are kind of the heavy hitters, the guys that I see all over the place, unfortunately, that kind of make my skin itch when I walk through like a Meyer Garden Center. Um, this includes plants that are legal for sale. So Michigan does have a prohibited and restricted species list. This includes things that you cannot legally sell or move in the state of Michigan. So again, things like Japanese knotweed. It's not legal for sale in Michigan because we've recognized that it can cause some very significant problems. And so we want to keep that out of trade. And then note, of course, other invasive species are problems in our in our landscape. So things like um, honeysuckle, I haven't included on this list, but they can definitely cause some issues once they get out and about. So the first species I want to cover is one that like when I'm actually doing this in a room usually gets a couple of like gasps or little chatters and that's baby's breath. This is a very, very common plant, maybe not necessarily in your yards, but it's definitely in your floral arrangements. And this is a huge problem, especially for our friends that are managing dune habitats. I worked for Sleeping Bear Dunes in the past and they had like a 10 person crew whose job 40 hours a week all summer was to go out and remove baby's breath. And the primary issue with this, once it gets out onto the um, dunes and into the wild is that it spreads very, very quickly and it really overstabilizes dunes. Dunes are a resource that needs to move in order to stay healthy and in order to provide habitat for endangered species like pitcher's thistle, which only grow in those shifting areas of sand. And so as you can see in that top photo, that taproot on baby's breath is wild. <laughs> it can do a really, really good job of holding down this area and then becoming the only thing that's growing there because the plants that should be growing there are used to it kind of moving around and shifting and always having something new. So I would encourage you to remove this from your yards if it is something that you see there. Also to cut it out of your bouquets. If you're someone that does enjoy having fresh flowers, look specifically for arrangements that do not include baby's breath, especially if anyone is planning a spring wedding. I know that it's common there. Um, and replace these instead with some delicate little white flowers that we have native, such as mountain mint or flowering spurge. Both can provide that kind of airy, beautiful, edging that you sometimes see being utilized from baby's breath without the risk to some of those dune environments. The next one is Bradford pear. This is one that we brought over because it was supposed to be a sterile species, right? It's not going to be able to reproduce, but unfortunately it hybridizes really, really quickly with everything else in its genus almost. It, so it can reproduce with 
many of our other pair species and create these non-sterile clones, which then can just take over areas, as you can see in that bottom photo. These were planted pretty frequently because it has this nice regular shape. It's pretty easy to take care of. It's pretty salt tolerant. It wasn't going to really cause a problem. It was easy to take care of. And it's a very early flowering species of tree. Unfortunately, it gets pretty messy with age, frankly. It has on a landscape scale, the problem of filling in these prairies and grassland areas where we want more open habitat so that it crowds out these areas where we're trying to preserve prairies. It actually can also be a vector or a host for diseases to our fruit trees. So that could be a big problem for some of our fruit farmers in the areas. And frankly, if you've ever been out on like a street that is lined with Bradford pear in spring, they smell terrible. The flowers are really, really unpleasant. And so we want to be able to replace those with species that have more desirable characteristics. So service berry or the amelanchier species are native here in Michigan. They also have those beautiful little white flowers. They're a small tree. They can also grow into a shrub habitat if that's what you prefer. So you can see from that photo, in the green, it does. It can have multiple stems oftentimes, so you get more of a full appearance as opposed to like a lollipop appearance that you see sometimes with Bradford pear. It does need quite a bit of sun, but it is pretty, pretty tolerant. And then the other one, a personal favorite of mine, here in Southwest Michigan, we can grow beautiful flowering dogwood. Um, this is a very, very showy tree with larger white flowers, and it has more of a spreading habitat. These are gorgeous trees to have on the landscape and they're also a fantastic early early flower as well. Uh, the next species I want to talk to is Himalayan, Himalayan balsam. So this is one that I don't see too often in trade but is a very high risk species that isn't yet listed on that prohibited and restricted species list. This is something that some folks um, in that work with bees or pollinators, it does flower beautifully and largely, uh, but unfortunately it spreads very, very quickly. Uh, and so you can see in that bottom photo a vehicle almost kind of swamped out by Himalayan balsam. One of the major problems with most of the invasive species we're going to talk today, today about today is just overcompetition. There are too much competition for our native plants because they aren't susceptible to diseases, they spread very quickly, and so that they can cause some really significant problems. This species in particular, uh, much like our native impatience, which we'll talk about, has seeds that explode out of the capsules. So if you touch a um, ready seed pod, it can launch its seeds. And as you can see from these photos, it likes growing in wetter areas. And so it can move very, very quickly. This is not here in lower Michigan. I don't know of any patches near us, though there are some problems with Himalayan balsam up, I believe in the Charlevoix area. And I believe there's also some up near Sault Ste. Marie. So it's something that we want to keep an eye on. And there are definitely some fantastic alternatives. So for instance, there's something in the same genus that is native here in Michigan, or jewelweed, or um, Touch, native spotted touch me not is one of my favorite wildflowers to spot when I am out and about. It does like it pretty wet, um, but it has these beautiful showy orange flowers, as you can see in that top photo. And it does the same kind of exploding its seed pods, which is always fun for kids uh, or kids at heart, such as myself. Another great option would be something like wild columbine, which has, again, very, very showy flowers, similar to most of the garden columbines we see. It gets a little bit taller and lankier than you'll see with jewelweed, but those red flowers are pretty popular with pollinators, so it's a great addition to those kinds of gardens. The next one is Japanese barberry. This is a species that I see pretty much everywhere. It's kind of the McDonald's plant. You see it in parking lots and in islands where they don't want to have to do much upkeep, and that is because you can kind of just like ignore it and it's going to do its own thing. Unfortunately, this plant is really, really tricky for us. It gets out and basically just swamps the understory of forests, which can limit mammal habitat. And the biggest thing with barberry is it's actually been shown to increase ticks. So because this plant grows so dense and so thick, it keeps things nice and moist and warm in the understory, which is perfect for ticks. So if you have barberry, you may see an increased tick population, which can be a threat to human and animal health, and we want to get out. 
So if you are looking for a native species that is just as tolerant, uh, something like a sink foil is a beautiful alternative. So that's the top one on our plant instead. It has these beautiful little five petal yellow flowers and is very, very hardy. I have seen this in the same like McDonald's parking lots and it's just fine. It, it is just happy on its own. If you are looking for something that provides kind of that interest of the red foliage that you get from a Japanese barberry, something like Michigan holly could be a good alternative. So this is one that, like barberry, holds onto those berries throughout the winter and then is able to provide that winter interest in a yard by holding on to those. Michigan holly is one that does have both male and female plants. So if you want to have that fruit set, you're going to need a couple in your yard to make sure that they are able to provide that role. Next up, the next couple I've combined, because the offending uh, native invasive plants kind of share the same characteristics or fill the same niche in your yard, and we're going to replace them with many of the same plants. So here we have butterfly bush and burning bush, and this is another one where I get some tittering. Uh, these are very, very common in the landscape. They're both beautiful shrubs. Uh, butterfly bush has it right there in the name, right? If I want to provide food for butterflies, for pollinators, of course I'm going to buy a butterfly bush. It's in the name. Um, unfortunately, this is, though a very good pollen source, pretty much a dead zone for um, insects being able to utilize it for their young. So just like a monarch butterfly needs milkweed in order for its young to lay its eggs and for them to be able to grow up as caterpillars, most pollinator species have a couple that they can they can lay on. Only one species of pollinator really utilizes, is able to use butterfly bush for this. So it's a very narrow um, portion of the lifetime that they are able to utilize this shrub. So we want to make sure that we're providing kind of a lifespan long habitat for our pollinators and butterfly bush isn't a great choice for that. Also, they seed like crazy. So this is actually a compound flower, that big long spike of flowers, which means it can produce thousands of seeds and those thousands of seeds can move very, very quickly and escape our yards and move into native areas pretty quickly. Burning bush, much the same, is very popular in the landscape trade, uh, primarily for its bright red foliage. Um, but this is something that can also spread and seed very quickly. So there you can see it growing all in that tree line and just starting to shade out and outcompete our native species. So if we're looking for something for our pollinators, there are you know, hundreds of native species that we can really turn to. Something like butterfly weed is just as showy as butterfly bush with those bright orange flowers. This is an herb, not a shrub, but it can get fairly tall as well. And it does provide more of those lifelong resources for our pollinators. Something like buttonbush, if you have a wetter yard, is very, very popular with pollinators. It has these really cool little spherical flowers that make me think of like a Dr. Seuss plant. It's always very fun. And then if you're looking for something that has that very showy fall foliage, viburnum. Many of our viburnums are great suggestions to move into that spot because they do have oftentimes that dark red color in the fall, but also provide these showy white flowers for our pollinators and other animals throughout the year. Uh, these two are ones that are very good examples of how oftentimes the reason we want to plant something is the reason it can become invasive. So we plant things like English ivy or periwinkle as ground covers. We just have a patch that we need to fill. We have a spot that we need something that's not going to take much work. It's going to reproduce very quickly. It's going to cover the ground. But ecologically, that's not great. So if we think about the forest floor, when we're going for a hike, there is a smattering of different types of plants. It's not 100% coverage usually. And there's a lot of variation. As opposed to when we plant something like English ivy or periwinkle, there isn't much variation. It has a tendency to swamp and cover up those native species that it may be competing with. Both of these are things that I've seen for sure in wilderness areas or in native forests where we want to protect them. And then in the case of English ivy, this can also climb trees. And climbers can be problematic because they can oftentimes swamp or um, damage the trees that are supporting them. So we want to be very, very careful with that. Periwinkle also goes by a number of other names. So things like vinca, 
uh, Myrtle. Many times these common names are multitudes, right? We have a definite large number of those. So if we're looking for a native plant that is able to kind of just fill up an area and cover some ground and make sure that we're able to protect that, something in where you have a bit more sun would be wild geranium. Again, this is a very pretty plant. It looks kind of delicate almost, but it has a beautiful big purple flower, much like periwinkle or wild ginger is one of my favorites. It's a beautiful, thick, almost waxy looking um, undergrowth species. So it grows very, very low to the ground. It, it can have fairly large leaves. It doesn't need much sun. It grows in these closed canopies of forests. And that, this one is really interesting because it actually has its flower underneath of the leaves of the plant because of um, it isn't traditionally pollinated by bees, it's pollinated by other species so that the flower can be under the leaves. So there are definitely options for ground covers. They can be a little bit more difficult. Something like bearberry would also be a fantastic option here. But we want to remember when we are choosing plants for our yard that those same characteristics, the quick growing, the um, very tolerant, these kinds of things have a tendency to cause them to cause problems in other areas if our native species are not adapted for that kind of competition. Lastly, I want to touch on one water garden gardening species. So water gardens or koi ponds are very, very popular. They can be a wonderful addition to our yards and our areas, but we want to be careful with what we choose in these because the vast majority of our aquatic invasive species have been introduced through the aquaculture trade. Uh, these species grow very, very quickly. Oftentimes aquatic plants can grow from portions of plants. So things like Eurasian water milfoil can reproduce by fracturing because it's a common adaptation for aquatic plants. And then sometimes in the sediment that the plant comes in, in your soil, you'll get a bunch of surprises. So we want to be very, very careful. Water hyacinth is legal for sale in Michigan. It is a trade species. It may or may not overwinter in Michigan yet. We, we don't have conclusive evidence either way. But down south where it is able to overwinter, we see really significant problems with it kind of just packing up <laughs> these waterways. So it can reproduce very, very quickly. Um, it can reproduce asexually. So the biggest thing to remember when water gardening, especially when water gardening with non-native species, is be very careful with how we dispose of our plant parts. So we never want to compost invasive species because they, the seeds or the rhizome or the root may be able to survive unless we get to a high heat. And that's very, very true in places like water hyacinth and with our water gardening. I do want to point out the Ripple program, Reduce Invasive Pet and Plant Escapes. This is a fantastic statewide program that aims to help aquaculture businesses and owners understand the best way to reduce the animals and plants that are getting out of the aquaculture industry. So for instance, we just had a week or two ago, a big scare with zebra mussels coming in on moss balls, right? So we were able to have this interface with this industry through the Ripple program to better understand what that means and how we can work together for it. Thankfully, we have just so many beautiful native aquatic plants. Much of my work is in wetlands, so I'm very, very biased. Um, but I think that our native plants can absolutely stand up to things like water hyacinth or water lettuce that can cause significant problems when they escape. So something like fragrant water lily is a very, very showy native species. I have seen these beautiful white flowers in the middle of a rainstorm, just looking pristine and perfect as I am soaking and unhappy with myself. Um, so it is a beautiful thing to add to koi ponds, especially where you need some, some shade or some cover. And then also things like pickerel weed, which is very, very common in many of our marshes. If you've ever been out on the Paw Paw River, you have probably seen pickerel weed. It too has this spike of purple flowers. It can be very showy and very nice addition to those areas. Um, so I encourage you to look for native alternatives in water gardening, just because there are some fantastic options. And I'm very, very biased, but I think that they are being a little, sold a little short sometimes in these areas. 
Lastly, I wanna cover a couple of forest pests that I want folks to be aware of in their yards. Uh, oftentimes our trees are kind of these focal points in our yards. They're things we're very, very proud of. We want to be able to maintain and to make sure that they are able to kind of be with the house for a long time, right? We don't imagine having to take down our oaks or take down our hemlocks. And we wanna make sure that those species stay, stay, stay safe. And there are many things that we can do one of the biggest issues that we're having, uh, one of the things I get the most calls about is something called oak wilt. So this is a fungus that pretty much grows up through the water moving tissues of a tree and suffocates it from the inside, if you will. So trees are basically just a whole bunch of drinking straws that you've taped together. And so they use those straws to move water and nutrients from the soil up to the leaves so that they can perform photosynthesis. So if you start plugging up all of those straws with a fungus, going to run into problems very, very quickly. And that's what happens with oak wilt. Oak wilt is one of the faster moving um, forest diseases. We can actually see this killing a mature red oak tree in under a year. So over long distances, this is largely moved by firewood. So that's another reason that we want to make sure if we are going camping or if we're having a bonfire, we're sourcing our wood locally. We don't want to load up the pickup truck to go camping and take it up to the UP because we could be transmitting a whole bunch of problems with us. On a short term distance, this is actually transmitted by a native beetle. So there are picnic beetles that will smell wounds in trees and they will go and feed on that wound on the sap that is coming from it. And then they'll move on to the next wounded tree. And if one of the trees they feed on has the oak wilt fungus, the spores of that fungus will come out in that wound and will get on the beetle and then they will take it to the next tree where it can get in. So the biggest thing as a homeowner to protect against oak wilt is to not trim your trees or cause damage to your trees during that growing period when the beetles are around. Because if you cut a tree in December, there are no beetles to feed on that sap in December here in Michigan. But if you cut it in May, there are probably going to be some beetles that are coming for a little snack. Um, so damage can be trimming back oak trees, but it could also be weed whacking. If you knock bark off of the tree, that could cause a wound. Uh, if you have a limb break in a storm, things like that are all problems. If you do cause damage, if you do lose a limb in the storm, what you can do is paint those wounds um, with an arborist paint or something like that to stop the beetle from being able to reach it, and that can prevent damage. But really, we just want to keep a lookout for oak wilt. Oak wilt is very, very hard to manage once it's introduced. So those preventative cures are really worth it here. But when you think you have oak wilt, you'll see it dying back generally from the top down. And you'll also see this really noticeable discoloration of the leaves from the margins or the edges of the leaf in towards that mid vein. And they'll be dropping their leaves, you know, midsummer, late spring, which is really when an oak tree should be holding on to them. If you have a very um, kind of end case treatment of oak wilt, what it'll actually do is start forming these pressure pads under the bark where all of those reproducing structures of the fungus are growing and they'll split the bark, which is a wound that the beetles will smell, and then they will feed on that wound and take those spores elsewhere. So we want to be very careful with our, red, especially our red oaks during that growing period to protect them from oak wilt. The other species of forest pests that I want folks to be aware of in their yards from a landscape perspective is hemlock woolly adelgids. So hemlocks are a very, very popular tree for landscaping. They are beautiful, they're long lived, they're very, very shady. So they're popular in our homes and around our lawns. Unfortunately, this insect, we kept it out of Michigan for a very long time. So this has been around out east for about 50 years, but we found it here just a couple of years ago. And it moves very, very quickly because it's a very small insect. So if you brush against an infected tree during the summer, you can, you can probably end up with it on your clothes and bring it to your next destination or bring it back home. So you're going to be very careful with hemlock woolly adelgid. Again, it is much, much easier to prevent the spread of these species than to get rid of them once they are here. So with hemlock woolly adelgid, that looks like moving your bird feeders away from hemlocks. So if you have a bunch of hemlock trees on the north side of your house, move all your bird feeders to the south. And what that does is it will stop birds from using those hemlock trees as their perch before coming to the feeder. 
So birds, again, if you brush against an infected tree and then brush against an uninfected tree, can be a major vector. They can carry hemlock woolly adelgid. We also want to be very, very careful with trimming back hemlocks along driveways or parking areas because, again, you can brush against infected trees with our vehicles. So it's just something that we want to be conscientious of with our hemlock trees. And then when we are looking to identify hemlock woolly adelgid, we actually have a grant to do this right now. So we look for hemlock woolly adelgid in the winter when it isn't moving, when it's safe for us to be around these trees. So we'll be doing these surveys for about another month. But if you see hemlock woolly adelgid, it'll be on the underside of the branches. And at the base of each leaf, they say like the armpit, there will be a little fuzzy mass. And that is the insect where he has hunkered down and he has put in a big long straw to suck out all of the sugars that this plant is making. And he's made a nice little protective coat um, around him. So you have these little fuzzies on the undersides of your branches. So we're happy to take a look. We can come out for free and do a survey for hemlock woolly adelgid, or you can always send us photos um, we're really trying to get a handle on where this species is in Michigan so we can protect our hemlock trees. So I have officially scared everyone. I have given you this long list of things not to do. So what are the things that we can do to kind of protect our yards and to make these a uh, safer or healthier place ecologically? So the biggest thing is to plant smart. Right? So we don't want to be picking invasive species when we go and start those landscaping projects in spring. We want to leave the Japanese barberry at their nursery. We want to choose things that are going to not cause a problem down the road or for someone else or probably for ourselves, frankly. So pick native when you can, when it's available. And again, remember that just because this species is available, it's in the nursery, doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best choice e logically for our area. It's just something that is in high demand. Be sure to always dispose of our plants and our plant parts safely. So that would include making sure that we are not always composting our invasive species, that we aren't throwing our brush uh, in the wood edges if we know it contains seeds or things like that. There are better ways be disposing of these things. Uh, we want to know when to prune and when to avoid tree damage. So again, with oak trees and especially with red oaks, avoiding those beetle periods um, is, is really good. So avoid the growing season primarily with our oak trees. We need to be sure to share our knowledge. So we have about 55 people on here today and that is fantastic and I'm Honestly, so excited that you are all here, but that is a small portion of the gardeners in our area, right? Or the, our neighbors who may have that butterfly bush out front. So this isn't necessarily common knowledge. So it's something that we wanna make sure that we are sharing and that we can help other people accomplish in their properties as well. And then as always, we wanna make sure that we're not in moving invasive species. Invasive species are something that is very, very hard to get rid of once they're well established. So when we go for a hike, making sure our boots are clean. When we are parking our RV, we're making sure we're not brushing against hemlock trees. Just taking these little preventative steps can be very, very helpful in the grand scheme of things. Lastly, we can also look for partner programs. So look for people that are helping to provide more native species or remove invasive species from our, our sales. So for instance, the Go Beyond Beauty program is this fantastic program through the Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network, which works with landscapers and uh, greenhouses to certify that they aren't selling what we would consider high-risk invasive species. And we're excited to be working with them to extend that program statewide coming soon. So we can look for programs like Go Beyond Beauty we can also look for native plant sales. So for instance, all of our conservation districts right now are in the middle of a native tree and shrub sale. So that's a great way to get some native options for our yards. But other programs as well, such as Wild Ones, have wonderful annual native plant sales. They're always happy to help get more native plants on our landscape to really help better protect our area. And then lastly, there are organizations such as the Michigan Native Plant Producers Association, which works with a number of local growers in Michigan so that we have species that are adapted to our climate and to our specific area. So looking for native genotypes or specific native species can sometimes be very difficult and they can be a fantastic resource for that. 
Also, we want to report invasive species. Again, they're so much easier to treat when it's 16 garlic mustard plants instead of six acres. So if you see an invasive species, you can always report it. The, that would be through MISSIN or the Midwest Invasive Species Information Network. This is a fantastic app that you can put on your cell phone so you can take it with you on a hike. And when you see an invasive species, you can stop. It will use the GPS on your phone and you can say, hey, I saw some baby's breath here. There's about this much. It looked this dense. Here's a picture. And then the coordinator that is managing invasive species in that area has a better idea of where things are and what we can do to better manage that issue on the landscape. Because I promise you guys are going to see more than I ever will. I am one person. <laughs> I cannot walk every path. I cannot see everything. Uh, then lastly, you can always work with your CISMA. So these cooperative invasive species management areas are in every county in Michigan. I have to update my map on this slide. And we are grant funded programs that exist to help you guys. We're here to help citizens and municipalities better understand what problems invasive species pose and how everybody can help solve those problems. So we can help to identify the species that are in your yards. We can help give best management practices. We can help um, your municipality map out where all their knotweed is so that they can do some work on that. We really are trying to just provide these resources as much as we can. And so we really encourage you to reach out to us. So we can help with education, doing presentations such as this, with species ID, mapping, and treatment. Um, we can partner with your municipality or your camp owner or your neighborhood association or lake association to come up with some of these better plans on kind of scale. And we are really here to partner in any way we can to better protect our environment and our landscape from invasive species. So with that, I just want to thank you all so much for spending this, af this hour this afternoon with me. Uh, realistically, invasive species are something that come from somewhere. And a large number of them come in through the landscape industry every single year. And so it really is about trying to lessen that pressure from that industry so we can better protect and better maintain beautiful natural areas like this prairie. Thank you very much. And I, whatever questions you guys have. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nora. That was fantastic information. So um, we definitely do have some questions. So I'll start with the first one. Uh, someone is wondering, what is the best way to dispose of an invasive species plant? Yeah, so it depends on the species. Some of them um, can burn pretty easily. So uh, that is one major way to do it. Some of them can be composted. So it kind of depends on what heat they need to get to to kill the seeds. The state actually has a guide for invasive species um, disposal. And so it's a very nice PDF that explains, it has like little icons for what you can do with each um, that we would suggest folks to reference to. And if you shoot me an email, I'm happy to get you a copy of that. Great, thank you. I was just gonna ask, how can we find that? So that'll be excellent. Um, and maybe we can put that in our notes with the YouTube video as yes. well, that'll be helpful. Absolutely. So great. Um, okay, well, next question. Um, some folks are new to Michigan and their property is overrun with thorny, uh, thorny vines that are climbing the trees. To clear them, they're cutting from the ground and pulling off the trees. They wanna know how can they prevent them from coming back? Yeah, so one of the bigger problems when we're managing invasive species is that we're able to manage properties, but it came from somewhere, right? So there's probably still a seed source that's preventing a pressure. So the thing to do when treating is just to kind of keep up with it. So a lot of times it's never going to get as bad as when you start, as when you haven't done anything. So if you manage it, you might see them coming up and you can, to the point where you can just pull the seedlings, right? And that is a really easy management technique that you can kind of just do as you're walking your property. And it's no longer this weeks long effort of cutting and pulling. It's just kind of keeping an eye on things and maintaining, really. Another thing to do would be to plant in with native species. So if an area is disturbed, it's much more likely to uh, be susceptible to invasive species. So for instance, a fallow field or just an empty lot is 
very easy territory. It's, there's nothing competing. And so invasive species will often win out in those cases. So if you're able to establish a robust native population, the likelihood of invasives being able to outcompete is much less. Awesome. Thank you. And next, what um, are some of the best ways to remove periwinkle? Yeah, so uh, vinca is something that isn't super difficult to manage depending on the quantity you have. So it is one that can be managed through like repeated hand pulling is pretty easy with periwinkle. Um, but it's just going to, again, take some consistency, <laughs> some tenacity sometimes with treating that kind of species. And so um, I'm happy to send some specific BMP, uh, best management practices again if you reach out, but it's something that I'd start with hand pulling unless you're at like the acres kind of, kind of scale. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Nor, um, if, you know, for some of us like me who might not be great at plant identification, if we're out on a hike and we're wanting to be aware and look for invasives and report them on missing, um, what's maybe a good tool that we could use to become familiar with plant identification? Absolutely. Yeah. So plants are very hard. <laughs> when you're starting, right? Like plant blindness is a very real thing. Um, and so missin is really nice because it does have photos of all of the invasive species that um, they, they have for reporting, which is hundreds. So it has photos and descriptions of every single species that you could report, um, which you can compare against, which is very, very nice. Additionally, you can use some apps like uh, Seek, I believe is one that you can take a photo of it and it will compare that against a database of images that have been identified and say, hey, well, it's most common, it's most similar to this one, right? Uh, so it's a very easy way to use kind of this community knowledge. The thing, those apps are very, very helpful. Um, the thing I always say is run it through a logic filter. So the way that those photo apps work is that it is only as good as the data it's pulling from. So it has this public database of images where people say, yes, this is milkweed. And it will take your image and run it against every single milkweed image and say, yeah, that seems right. If there are only five pictures, that's not much information. And so it sometimes throws wrong ideas. So just run it through a logic filter. If it's something that's not supposed to be in Michigan, maybe look at some of the other options that it gives or always feel free to send us pictures. <laughs> um, we've absolutely had folks be like, this looks like kudzu. And then it absolutely is kudzu. And we wouldn't have known unless someone sent us a photo. So we always are happy to get those. Great. And we can do that via email and the Southwest by Southwest Corner Sisma Facebook page mm -hmm. and the Van Buren Conservation Facebook page and then other conservation districts as well. So absolutely. That's very yep. helpful. Um, looks like we've got a couple more questions coming in, which is awesome. Uh, so what are the worst local invasives with underground root systems, making them especially difficult to remove? Yeah, so the first two that come to mind are um, Japanese knotweed, which is by far and away the one I get the most questions about, and Phragmites. So both of those are species that grow with um, rhizomes or these underground lateral root structures. Um, and so they can reproduce from portions of the root pretty much, which makes them very, very difficult to remove because it's going to be more than happy <laughs> to move around based on the disturbance of that root structure. And also it's storing just a ton of energy down in that root. Um, in the case of things like Japanese knotweed, that root actually uh, came from volcanic areas in Japan. So it can very quickly break through hardtop or concrete and cause some infrastructure damage. And so those are the two that I would look out for in terms of root systems. Great, thank you. And next, um, looks like you didn't mention star thistle or spotted knapweed um, as its beekeeper's favorite pollination plant as an invasive. Is there anything you could speak to regarding that plant? Yeah, so spotted knapweed is one that uh, we is managed pretty aggressively in Michigan through volunteer programs still. It's not something that we can, it's unfortunately everywhere is the real problem. So for instance, we're working with Wolf Lake State Fish Hatchery to remove it from their prairie program. It is a thistle. We've all seen it, it has kind of a 
whitish grayish green leaf and a pretty little purple spiky flower is on every playground imaginable uh, but it is really really aggressive and it's actually a little pathic it sends out chemicals through its roots to um, fend off competition from other native species and it moves very, very quickly. Thankfully, it can be managed through hand pulling. Uh, we don't necessarily need to go directly to chemical treatment on that uh, if we're consistent with it. And as our question asker stated, it's a favorite for um, beekeepers because it does have a huge blossom. It's very attractive to some pollinators and you will actually see people selling star thistle honey that means they are feeding on invasive spotted knapweed. So I would advise avoiding that one in particular. Um, but it that's the problem we run into is a lot of times we brought these species here for a reason or they are still here for a reason. So things like spotted knapweed, Himalayan balsam, even Japanese knotweed, um, pollinators like them. And so they have a tendency to go to those plants sometimes. And then we get some pushback from beekeepers in particular. But the reality is uh, kind of the way that I logic it out and I am not an entomologist so please ex excuse my plant person trying to explain insect facts. Um, pollinators in a lot of ways are sometimes like toddlers. They really want what they recognize. So they go for the foods they know, the chicken nuggets and the pizza of the plant world, until you offer them some cotton candy. And <laughs> the star thistle and the Himalayan balsam can be that cotton candy that kind of distracts them and actually leads to a decrease in pollination of our native species. So you want to, you can't just give cotton candy, <laughs> right? Yeah, definitely. That's a good analogy. <laughs> Um, okay, so next question. How do you rid of or control a species that has an underground root system? For instance, the vines we talked about earlier, um, you know, on a vacant lot, so they've really got a good hold in. Is there mm -hmm. something to really consider with that? Yeah, oftentimes um, it depends on the species, and I'm not certain what exact what particular species this is, but with a lot of our woody species, so for instance, things like oriental bittersweet, which is a climbing vine, we will cut the stump of the plant. So we are disconnecting everything that's causing problems up in the tree from the root system, from its nutrient stock, and then we will paint the stump with an herbicide. And that is because it will then stop, it will take that herbicide, a systemic herbicide, down into the root system so that it can't come back up from that root stock. Um, and by painting it instead of spraying it, we're avoiding these off-target impacts, for instance, for the other trees around it, things like that, or the, the native species we want to protect. So I don't um, want to give like particular, I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable giving, you know, like percentages and exact chemical names in this kind of context. I want to have a better idea of exactly what folks are working with because it's chemical control is something we want to be careful with and we want to make sure that we're making the most informed choices. Yeah, definitely. So that's, a, I think, definitely a good good example of something where Nor can help with specific property questions, you know, emailing her and then you can exchange pictures. And as the weather's getting nicer, it's easier to do property visits, um, mm -hmm. socially distance and such as well. So absolutely great. And then uh, maybe one last question, Ooh, two last questions here, and then we'll get wrapped up as we're getting close to the end of our hour. Um, First, we'll go with what is the best way to get English ivy off of an oak tree? The vines are very thick and deeply attached in the bark growing up the tree. Yeah, so I think that that, um, and again, this is something I'd be happy to contact and send specific best management practices on, uh, but that is something probably where you're going to want to try and, and cut the vine maybe like a foot-ish couple uh, off the ground um, to disconnect that root system. Um, and then it's, uh, it's something that we would have to send some more specific, um, recommendations for on, on specific treatment of English ivy. But. Great. Sounds like your inbox is going to be full after this. <laughs> I'm always happy to answer those questions. <laughs> And then finally, uh, someone has said, my church has an incredible garden of milkweed. How do we please the folks who think it's a weed while preserving the nourishment for monarchs? Absolutely. Well, first off, thank you guys so much for taking care of that garden and creating that habitat. Um, one of the big problems we run into is that native plants, though beautiful, 
are not necessarily beautiful in the way that people are used to like a very neat, tidy garden being beautiful. And so in my mind, it's all about reframing and teaching and it's an educational opportunity. So for instance, a lot of folks will utilize uh, monarch way station signs in front of those areas so that folks know it's not just a garden bed we don't take care of. <laughs> it is serving a purpose and we are taking care of our environment. And we're taking care of the world around us. Um, and it's something that we're always happy to talk about in educational programs or in incorporate into Sunday school or those kinds of places where we can really help. Um, especially in kind of that context, it's very, very easy to get kids really into nature. It's very, very easy to be like, let's go look for caterpillars. Let's go see what's in the garden today. And then they get really excited about it. And then they trick their parents into getting really excited about it. Um, so it's something that we can all work on together to try and change the norm of what we see as beautiful into something, again, that is, is ecologically intact, thriving ecosystem. Awesome. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Noor. It's been wonderful having you on behalf of the Southwest by Southwest Corner Sisma and the Liberty Hyde Bailey Museum. We're so glad that you were able to spend this hour with us and look forward to being able to reach out to you with more questions. Um, I just want to share my screen one more time here with some final thoughts for our participants. Um, this is just day one of our Backyard Symposium series, so I really want to encourage folks to, you know, email Noor. She had her email up for a long time, or you can contact us at vanburencd.org slash contact if you're looking to get in touch with her or anyone else on staff. Um, in addition, we have a monthly newsletter that we send out where she sometimes will do an invasive spotlight and we'll get some good information there. And finally, uh, the webinar was recorded. So like I said before, the recorded webinars will be made available on YouTube next week, and we will email everyone who registered ahead of time to let you know that that has been done. We'll also be making a post on Facebook where Noor shares a lot of uh, helpful information at Van Buren CD or Van Buren Conservation District, so you can get little snippets there as well. And finally, please remain excited about our remaining sessions next uh, tomorrow at two o'clock. You can use the same link that you used to attend today. We will be talking about gardening at home or gardening 101 with Christopher Imler from MSU Extension. And we're looking forward to that as well. So thanks again, Noor, and thank you everyone for attending.